Thank you. Um, Kenny, I was reading about the, the, the fact that this movie involved a special, maybe unusual con uh, degree of research for you um, of uh, the place and the people. Is that uh, correct? Or? Well, I wouldn't say it was an unusual uh, per se, uh, but I didn't grow up in the area and I, so I, and there's something about the specifics of the location that were very important, so I did end up doing a fair amount of research, but a little goes a long way, truthfully. But I tried to find out all I could about the area when we were writing it. And also then when we were uh, doing the prep and the shoot, we, we yeah. I think we really got to know the area then, and we tried to get as much of that experience into the picture. Yeah. Were you able to use a lot of locals? Was that in, in you know, the... Well, I'd say most, not most, but not all of the actors that you don't recognize are, are local actors. Yeah. Um, not all. There's a there's quite a few really good New York actors in there, <laughs> but there's a really good, strong acting community up in Boston, mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to draw on uh, quite a few of them, which mm -hmm. I think was really important. One of the things that's really unusual about the film and exceptionally beautiful is the choice of music, and that's something that I guess uh, I wondered where you arrived at that when you were making the movie. Well, that's interesting because I, I had no overall conception for the music, and I only made three movies, so I can't really say what I do. <laughs> but, um, I, but I do start out with just what I like, and you try different things against the picture, and there's sort of an instinctive feeling when, when it sounds right and seems to enhance the, the story in some way or enhance the scene in some way. I think with this movie, uh, it was, I noticed that music that worked tended to be very beautiful, and I think that maybe is because the story is kind of rough, and uh, very rough in spots, and I, there's something about the very beautiful music that I think, and the, uh, there's a somewhat ethereal quality to a lot of the pieces we chose, and to a lot of the pieces that Leslie Barber composed, and those always seem to work best. Uh, and I, I'm not sure why that is. I think it might have something to do with the contrast between the surroundings and the scenery and the beauty of the area and the, the, the anguish of, of uh, the main character's experience. And the size of the emotions exposed in the music matches the... Yeah, I think so. Um, but it usually just starts from me trying songs that I like. <laughs> and then suddenly the scene seems to have gone somewhere else in a good way and you're like, okay, that one works. I wanted to ask you just about one scene, and I'm not sure if I you know, have a specific question as much as if you could just take me through the, the shooting of the scene, which is one of the most extraordinary scenes in the movie when Casey Affleck and Michelle Williams are trying to come to terms at the end, and almost can. Um, I, I, you know, it looks like it was something that took a lot of concentration and um, time, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you could just talk about it a little bit. Well, um, I mean, they're both so extraordinary in the scene that it's, I, I mean, I, I, can, I, can I can appreciate it as much as anyone else without being immodest because they're so, their acting is just so good and they're both so full and they're both very ready to do the scene when we came to shoot it. And I suppose by that time they really understood where the characters were at each step of the story and I had to say very little uh, directorially uh, to them. I did, we, we had rehearsed everything uh, over a few weeks well before we started shooting. Um, so we discussed the dynamics, we discussed the dynamics of that scene a, a fair amount. And then they showed up and they just, we did a number of takes, we had two cameras and they were just, all the, t everything, it was all, it was all really good. Occasionally Casey'd say he didn't feel good about this one or that one, but uh, that that's a bit that's kind of what he's like and uh, it was just a real that was a pleasure and a pain to pain painful to watch uh, and the one thing that struck me uh, which I don't know if I verbalized this quite this way at the time was how, how and I, but I think I did because the, I was trying they both ask a lot of questions Michelle and Casey they they really want to know at least what my perspective is before they start to 
enhance it and make it real for themselves. And I said, which I that I think they're both trying so hard to be nice to each other. She's she she wants she's desperate to help him and to reestablish some sort of connection, but she doesn't want to make him. She doesn't want to hurt him even more by doing that. And he can see she wants to do that, and he can't do it, but he doesn't want to make her feel bad for asking. And then, she, so they keep bumping over each other to try to t take care of each other, and they're, they're no longer, they're not ever going to be together again. And then they have this incredible common sorrow between them. And I just, they're, they're, both, both, they're both such loving people in real life, and they're both such loving characters that it was, that, I, I think I pointed that out, and that, that was helpful. But, I did not provide the enormity of emotion that you see up there. I mean, they're just, they're just both very extraordinary and very, very specific about how they're approaching each other. Yeah, okay. Uh, objects often fail us in real life, and objects fail them a lot in your film. The, the stretcher that doesn't go into the ambulance, the chicken falling out of the freezer, the car being gone. Did, were they all in the script? Did, you, did some of those things um, happen while filming? Um, can you talk about those objects? Well, that's a really great question. Um, uh, the only object that I can think of offhand that was not in the script was the ambulance failing, the, the gurney failing to, to collapse properly so they could get inside the ambulance. Um, and I, it's a, just an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of it exactly, except that I know that I can never get the door open and the drawer's always stuck and I get, we don't have a TV because I went like that to it thinking it was an old fashioned cathode ray TV and it's a flat screen TV and immediately just died. <laughs> And this is something that I guess that I grapple with personally in life a great deal. But um, I think in a, to answer the question in a slightly less personal way, I think that there's something about that's interesting when the world is just not lining up for you. You know, even in your, these moments of great sorrow, you know, the, pen, the, the pencil falls on the floor, or the, the doctor tries to hug you and you don't see it, so you bump into each other and I just, or some, you know, it could be a number of things and physical objects very often don't do what you want and I think it, it's just part of life. So anything that helps to enrich the, the I won't say fabrication, but the recreation of reality or the impression of reality, of emotional reality, uh, is always useful. And when that gurney was collapsed, that, there, we did two takes of that particular scene, sequence, and uh, those are the local Manchester uh, EMS guys, and the gurney just wouldn't fold down. And we did one take, and we, but I kept the camera rolling, and then they got, it in, got her inside the ambulance. And then I said to them afterwards, I said, do you guys, we can stop for 15 minutes if you guys just want to practice, or if it needs to be oiled. And they're like, no, 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 we got it. We got it this time. We got it. It's fine. And then we did a second take, and it took twice as long. <laughs> and I think it's great, because it's just, it's so awful. Uh, and it's awful in a not, in not a, I mean, to me anyway, it's not a soap opera moment where the whole world stops from waiting for you to suffer. You know, they're really suffering and they can't get the thing to go in the ambulance. Anyway, just my attempt to make it as excruciating as, as possible. <laughs> I am so deeply moved by this film. I have to say that at the very beginning of my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're a storyteller, and I wondered what the difference at the core of, of writing for theater and writing for cinema, and what, what the difference is in the, the desire to tell the story in different mediums. Well, that's, that's it's something I think about a lot. It's, it's forgive the crummy first part of the answer, but when I think about something that feels like it would be good to write as a play, there's often something that strikes me as being a very theatrical image or a theatrical situation or a theatrical setting, whether it's a 
medieval France or these or classroom of an astronomy professor in New York City or some kid's apartment in the Upper West Side in 1982, just to give a couple of examples. And then for the three films that I've done, there was always, uh, when I, the environment was always a crucial part of it from the beginning. And I think that's the first thing, so, and, and that to me makes it cinematic. I was gonna say one feels more theatrical and one feels more cinematic, but that's a meaningless answer. Um, uh, the physical environment and the world that the characters live in are so much better portrayed by uh, exteriors anyway, by film than by the theater. The theater is really good at creating interior environments and there are people who are masterful at creating all kinds of environments on stage, but I'm not one of them. I, I, people in a room tends to be, I think, what the theater is best at pulling you and drawing you into. It's not great at conveying the great outdoors, um, except by suggestion or or by inference. Um, so I would say that was the first main factor. I always thought of the, my first film, I thought of the small town that it takes place in. My second film, I thought very much of New York City and, and all its immensity. And then for this film, obviously, the sea and the boats and the cold and the New England winter and the architecture. And then following all that in, in, in the train of all those different directions is the people who live there and what they do inside their environment and in relation to it. And, and your, your visualization of, of either form, is it, is it in your mind's eye, so to speak? Do you see it differently? It, today, it, it, in your visualization of either form, is it in your mind's eye? Do you see them differently? Yeah, very much so. I, I, see, I see the in both cases, I, have, I see it in, as just p real human beings in a real environment, and then in the back of my mind, I see the film writing as taking place in the context of a film that I'm watching. And in the theater, it's a, I don't quite see it as being distanced from the stage like an audience says, but I de definitely think of it in terms of what's inside the, the proscenium, whether it ends up being a proscenium or not, but I, that's how I tend to think. Thank you. Hi, Ken. Congratulations. You've made a great movie. Oh, thank Very you. Very moving. Um, I was really totally surprised by uh, Casey Affleck. What? Uh, I, he's never been this wonderful, and I'm sure he's going to get an Oscar nomination, if not actually win. Um, Stephen Hope from Awards Daily, I can say this. But anyway, um, he's a front runner right now. So. Um, <laughs> What, uh, did you write this for Casey? And what was your process working with him? His, his work is so fine in this. Well, I, I obviously couldn't agree more. I think he's amazing in this. I've always thought he was a really special actor. He and I worked together. He did a, he was in a London production of my play, This Is Our Youth, in 2002, I think. And that's when we first worked together. He, we worked together on some readings in New York and uh, a little one act they did at one point uh, downtown with Naked Angels. And he was, initially Matt Damon was gonna play the role and then he, his schedule just didn't work out and he very graciously uh, told me that, you know, I, we said he, he, he wanted, he agreed to offer the role to Casey who had been on deck in a sense because we weren't sure Matt's schedule was gonna work out and Casey had already read the script. And working with him was just a real delight. I had never worked with him this closely or this intensely. And uh, it was one of the most satisfying and interesting experiences I've ever had collaborating with an actor. And I've been very lucky to work with a lot of really great actors. Uh, he's very, really wants to know everything he can possibly know. And he wants to explore every direction available. And he, he has a somewhat obsessive and prosaic drive to understand what's happening. He says, well, if I'm, if I'm trying to put a wall up, if you say that I'm trying to be task-oriented in this scene, why, am I, why do I bother to stop and thank the doctor? And he's not picking the script apart. He's asking me like, what, how I see it and what I meant and what, we're what, what, we're what are we both trying to get at and how can he be real in that moment? That's one that I always remember because he said, this was fairly early on, and he said, well, why do I thank the doctor? I don't give a shit about him when he says, uh, I'm sorry for your loss. 
And I didn't have an answer, but it felt right to me that he would say thank you. So I thought he makes you think about what you wrote and what you're trying to, what you see is the reality of, of the story and of the situation. And I said, I think he doesn't skip past anything. I think he stops and does what's right in front of him. And that's how he gets through his day. And if he can't do that, he, and when, when then I thought, had the thought when, when the day's over he, and he's nothing left to do, he goes out and he gets drunk and he beats people up, or he gets himself beaten up is more what he's looking for, I think. Um, and that was something that was a real, uh, that was kind of our pole star in terms of navigating the character through the, through the to stretch the metaphor way too far through the ocean of the film. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, uh, it was wonderful because he was so specific and so grounded and so emotional and just, I don't, I think that strange behavior, the, and it ends up with the character being very odd at first and you don't know what's wrong with him. And, and, but it's very truthful and very believable and then when you see somebody, he lo then you talk about, sorry if this is too long of an answer, but then you talk about these, uh, occasionally when he meets somebody that he likes, like the girl uh, whose toilet he fixes, uh, played by Quincy Bernstein at the beginning of the film, and, you could, and, I, and we talked, he's, he says, I'm nicer to her. I said, well, I think you want to ask her on a date, but you're not going to do that because you don't get involved with people anymore. And there's that moment at the door, which is nonverbal, but we've all this, we, we had discussed, and he, and I, he said, why do I, I don't, he had a lot of trouble with that line he has where she says, can I give you a tip? And he says, do you mean a suggestion? <laughs> and he said, I don't understand that. And I said, he said, I think it's really funny, but I don't know how to say it. And I said, I think you're in such a distanced place from everyone that it makes you not understand normal conversation because you're so trying to control your interactions so much because you don't want to have any more real interactions because of what you've been through. And he said, okay, that's sort of helpful. And anyway, so it was like that the whole time, but really fun and interesting because we got to a whole gang of places that we wouldn't have gone without it. As a kind of a practical question, you mentioned before if you would say, okay, that one didn't feel right to me. If something feels right to you, but it doesn't feel right to the actor, do you usually give them another take? Yeah, of course. I mean, Sure, you're there, it takes a while to get there, it takes a while to set up, and it takes the, the time it takes to shoot the scene is nothing compared to the time it takes to set it up, and you're not going to get another chance. So uh, occasionally, if I really feel it's there and someone really doesn't, that's very rare. I can't actually remember that happening, even with Casey. Usually with Casey, it goes, it goes well, it goes, it's rocky, and then, by the, and then I'm like, I think we've got it, and he'll be like, sure, sure you don't want to try something else? Sure, anything else we should do? <laughs> and all these people are standing around. And, and then you think, well, maybe I said, and then they'll say, like, well, all right, just do whatever you want. Then we'll do something else, and it'll either be better or not, and then you move on. <laughs> Thank you very much. I didn't expect to cry so much. Um, I was just wondering, another Casey Affleck question, I know he's from that area, so did he help out with the other actors in terms of their accent, and did he help you find locations? No and no. <laughs> uh, he's very generous with the other actors as an acting partner, and he was very helpful and encouraging with Lucas, and he's wonderful. To, and when any child wanders onto the set, he's incredibly warm and fatherly and, and chummy. Um, but he, he let the other actors deal with their own accents and we had a locations person who, and he had plenty to do without, without chipping in on that score. It, it's a tough accent to do and it's done beautifully, <laughs> you know, uniformly. Well, we had a really, really great accent coach and, we, and the actors, most, for the most part, have really good ears and, and a lot of people are from the area, so I hope, I hope so. We tried anyway. A microphone down here. Uh, sort of a follow-up uh, with Casey and Lucas's relationship. It seems so incredibly organic, and obviously that has a lot to do with your with the dialogue. But um, did they spend a lot of time together prior, um, and was there any improvisation involved in any of their conversations? Um, they didn't spend any time together prior, except for a little rehearsal time. Um, the way their pre-production pre schedules worked out, they actually had less rehearsal than most of the other cast had with each other. And I mean, then 
the two of them just never were available at the same time until the very end of the prep. But they spent a lot of time together in that car between takes and driving around and around and around. And, and a lot of that work was done early on in the process, and I think it was very helpful for both of them. And by the time we, we were kind of in the swing of things, they, were, they had really developed a, a wonderful uh, relationship. And uh, I, 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 I mean, I think it comes through. There was no improvisation that I can remember. Um, there's a couple of moments, but I mean, I say that boastfully, but then I occasionally watch the movie and I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't write that. <laughs> but for the most part, it's all scripted. Thank you. Um, I was so deeply moved by the film. Thank you for that gift. My question is whether the flashback structure was something you had originally as your original idea, or if you came to that, and if so, how? Uh, it came to the flashback structure in my second pass of the script. The first pass was written chronologically, and I was, thought it was very boring. And so I, and I was, there were a number of things I wasn't happy with, but that was one of them. So I s basically started over again at the point which I found interesting, the first point in the sequence that I found interesting, which was his daily chores uh, at the apartment complexes that he works at. And that, but I had all this material written and I knew what had happened, um, more or less. And then I start, just started to drop it in and it right, felt right away to be a much more robust way to tell the story. So it then became a question of when they appear. And for a while I didn't worry about it too much because I wasn't, I, and Matt Damon was originally going to direct the film, so I thought, well, I'll let him worry about where to put the flashbacks. I'll just drop them in and he'll fix it in the editing room. And then by the time I, by the time the job of director devolved to me, I, uh, they were pretty well in place where they should, I moved them around a bit, but I wanted them to be, each one to be stimulated by something that was happening in the present. Um, and uh, they're actually fun to, to work with. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Amazing movie. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you all very much.